fascinating book and a very short introduction by the Oxford. It's by Christopher J. Berry. And just to give you a review, a book review, I'm going to read out something from here, from some pages here and there. So, of course, Adam Smith is the founder, father of economics. He wrote The Wealth of Nations. And having done a research scholar in economics, it interests me a lot. Uh, in the chapter 7, Legacy and Reputation, here it starts with an image of Adam Smith appears on a Bank of England 20 pound note. If Adam Smith is known at all, it is very likely in, in the context of, a, of the free market economies of economics of Thatcherism and Reaganomics. And of course, similar to other iconic thinkers like say Karl Marx or Sigmund Freud, Smith's Wealth of Nations today is invoked more than it's read. The subject matter of economics has changed dramatically. Nowhere does Smith use statistics or other quantitative methods that we do today. His writings provide a complex account of human behavior. Smith's principles are fundamental. They include the commitment to natural liberty, where everyone is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest, that is, his own way. The job of the government is limited to the task of external defense, internal order, and provision of public works. These principles are central to the free market. Ever since Wealth of Nations was published, it has been interpreted differently. And in summary, uh, here Christopher J. Berry talks about the organization of Wealth of Nations. And I'm just reading from pages. So Wealth of Nations comprises of five books and they are divided into chapters. The first book discusses the role and extent of division of labor. Now talking about division of labor book one, uh, in his illustrative way, he says it increases the productive power of labor and is the engine of economic growth. Its extensiveness the key to its provision of opulence, say talking about the multitude of cheap pins, is dependent on the size of the market. Where the population is small and scattered, the scope for an extensive market is small, so there is no need for division of labor. But when it's large, in these circumstances, uh, there is an incentive to specialize, so as to produce a surplus to exchange for the surplus of another specialist. So that's in where division of labor comes. Also, he talks at length about self-interest. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own nicest niceties but to their advantage and they never talk about niceties niceties but their advantage but to their advantage nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of his fellow citizens the butcher, butcher could well act benevolently and give some meat to the beggar but that could only be an occasional gesture because she would not stay in business long if she gave away her products. Now is it a claim that humans are motivated simply to satisfy their basic needs. Human work to produce and procure not just food, clothing and accommodation but also according but also conveniences according to the nicety and delicacy of their taste as well as to become objects of admiration. This is part of what makes us human. As a new cliche has it, man does not live by bread alone. Book two, now we're coming to book two. It examines the stock of capital, distinguishes between unproductive and productive or useful labor, 
So on his own criterion, Smith himself as a professor or author is unproductive. Unlike the manufacturer, that is the pen maker, for example, who makes an enduring product for, from given materials and thus creates capital that can be reinvested to promote economic growth, to make more and better pens. Now we come to book three. It is historical. It outlines how the feudal system of land tenure and the social and political power that ownership gave the land owners was gradually replaced by a commercial society. Talking about book four, it is largely polemical. He talks about the mercantile system. The mercantile system aimed to regulate the economy on the principle that exports should be increased, but imports restricted. The wealth of a nation consisted in a monetary surplus and benefited producers and not consumers. For Smith, wealth of nation lies in the productivity of labor and the better living standards. Um, and better to living standards that generates an outcome that is best achieved by free trade. One of the reasons, uh, so his reasoning, okay, so one of the reasons why Wealth of Nation is such a big book is that Smith is not dogma dogmatic. His reasoning is nuanced. His arguments frequently qualified. So his defense of free trade, for example, allows for exceptions. And the last, that is book five, is the longest. It focuses on sources of revenue and expenses. Expenses deal with socially necessary tasks like education, law and order, but which are unproductive in Smith's technical sense. And revenue raised through income tax, say government borrowing or incurring public debt. So in summary, Christopher J. Berry writes, The Wealth of Nations is a justly celebrated book in the history of economics or the study of how an economy works. It comes up, combines a comprehensive reach with a systematic, perhaps above all, the justification for Smith's renown lies in his new Torian achievement of Reducing complexity to simplicity. So Smith's renown lies in his Newtonian achievement of reducing complexity to simplicity. On the basis of self-interest and freedom, Smith built his most characteristic economic doc doctrines. Free trade is the best way to stimulate economic growth and thus increase the wealth of nations. Now, according to Marshall, the wealth of nations, the book Wealth of Nations, was the, great, was the greatest step that economics has ever taken because it combined a breadth of knowledge alongside balanced judgment. His principles are fundamental. They include the commitment to natural liberty where every man is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest in his own way. There's a job of the government that of external defense, internal order, provision of public works. Interestingly, Barry writes that Smith never severs ethics from economics. Liberalism is a mansion with many rooms. Smith's chamber has a commitment to equality Everyone is equal under the law. This is consistent with the fact that some will inevitably be wealthier than others, but it is inconsistent with distinctions or privileges based on birth or inherited rank. He is committed to equal liberty and equal respect, to which the porter just as much as the professional entitled. So this is where he writes, to which the porter, just as much as the professor, is entitled. So he writes, individuals are social beings, unlike some other rooms in the house of liberalism, 
Individuals in Smith's chamber are not separate beings whose behavior can be understood independently of their social environment or who passes natural rights outside a network of social obligation. So Christopher Berry writes that for Smith, what is valuable about liberty is that it makes possible the greater public good. This good is not about perfection. Smith does not envisage a society which is uh, within which all is sweetness and light. He's not in the business of drawing up a blueprint for a godly city or a land of virtue or and wisdom. Smith's good is more down to earth. For him, the true public good, the real wealth of nation that is, lies in the world of material well-being. Consumption is the purpose of production. To consume more and better goods is to enjoy opulence which is a blessing. This is most effectively obtained through humans acting on their own judgment of their interest. But these interests are not merely self-serving. As the opening sentence of the moral sentiment stated, humans as a principle of their nature incorporate disinterestedly the well-being of others and yet as his work strive to establish that is not to reject on moral grounds the role of the pursuit of one's own interest determined best interest. So see how interestingly he writes in the opening sentence of the moral sentiment stated, humans as a principle of their nature incorporate disinterestedly the well-being of others. So and in the pursuit of his own self-interest, one's own self-interest, it does general good to all. The good of all is done. So the place of the economy was limited to means, that is, essentially staying alive, which animals and slaves do, not the ends that make a human life worth living. The version of the good life treated as potentially degrading or inferior the pursuit of material pleasures, such as a desire for a linen shirt, fresh bread, or a comfortable home. And should these morally inferior economic means, that is, resources, become valued in their own right, then this was judged as corruption or transgression of moral standards. Smith rejected the whole argument, but that does not mean he morally disinfected the economy. The business of economics, the organizing framework for the provision of the wherewithal of living, is of itself valuable. Carrying out the business is a worthwhile task. It matters that humans can live life not dragged down by miserable poverty. It is a noble endeavor to lift humans from penury. The endeavor itself is set within the framework of moral values such as justice, humanity, probity, and law abidingness. They, along with the desire for praiseworthiness, underwrite the actual operation of the rule of law. The bulwark of liberty, like opulence, is a blessing. It is in this conjunction of opulence and liberty that Smith's legacy lies and i must tell you must read wealth of nations or even if you read this book it gives you a fairly good picture of what the book is all about wealth of nations i for one absolutely absolutely recommend this uh, and it's really enjoyable the way, the way he writes absolutely readable so we, here we have the chapter one, Life and Times, and the adjoining page has this picture of Adam Smith. And here he writes, the author of The Wealth of Nations, and it's taken from the engraving of Adam Smith, 1790 by John Key. 